Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Gary Winslet. I'm an assistant professor in the political science department here at Middlebury College and co-convener of the Alexander Hamilton Forum, an organization here at the college that brings in speakers to discuss important questions related to American public life, politics, and founding. Today is our distinct pleasure to welcome Mary Sarah Builder, Founders Professor of Law at Boston College Law School. She's a highly distinguished legal scholar with articles in the Yale Law Journal, Stanford Law Review, Yale Journal of Law and the Humanities, George Washington Law Review, and the Law and History Review. She's author of The Transatlantic Constitution, Colonial Legal Culture and the Empire, which came out from Harvard University Press in 2004. That was awarded the Littleton Griswold Award from the American Historical Association. Her more recent work is focused on the history of the Constitution, James Madison and the Founders, the history of judicial review, and colonial and founding era constitutionalism. She's here with us to, today to discuss her award-winning book, Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention. Uh, so without further ado, allow me to welcome Professor Mary Sarah Bilder. Uh, today she'll, she'll give her um, presentation and then we'll have Q&A at the end. So welcome Professor Bilder. Um, thanks, Gary. Thank you so much for having me. I hope I hope everyone can hear me fine with my little uh, headpiece on here. Um, I'm just delighted uh, to be here today um, for what I assume is is a Constitution Day um, lecture. So I put that on the slide. And I'm just sad not to be able to visit Middlebury, which I've always wanted to come uh, and visit in person. So you'll have to have me back at some point. Um, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes, 32 minutes. I have lots of slides. I get super bored um, listening to people. So I have lots of images and, and they'll move around along pretty fast. So if, if, you, if you close your eyes, you might miss one. Um, in thinking about uh, Middlebury, I was wondering if James Madison and Thomas and Jefferson passed by the town uh, on their journey in the spring of 1791 um, from Lake Champlain to Bennington. And someday I'm going to write more about that journey. It's a, it's a trip that I find very fascinating. Uh, historians have always wondered uh, what was the purpose, and, and there's much thought of uh, it being a secret conspiracy to build the Republican Party uh, and check out possible um, uh, people who might join them. Um, but tonight I'm going to focus on um, Madison a few years uh, earlier. Now I have to say it's, um, let me go, let me get my thing here working. Sorry, I've got the, whoa, I think I'll go. Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm, um, uh, it's sort of funny that I wrote a book about um, Madison because I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, I never actually thought about why Madison was named Madison as a kid. Um, a lawyer and federal judge, uh, James Doty, drew up the plans for the city in the 1830s. He'd actually canoed um, over 4,000 miles through the upper Great Lakes, the Mississippi, the Fox and Wisconsin rivers. And along the way, he learned Sioux, Winnebago, and Chippewa. And he argued for years that the proper spelling of Wisconsin was actually uh, with a K. Uh, in 1836, the year of the creation of the Wisconsin Territory, Doty laid out a plan for Madison. And James Madison had actually just died, though Doty probably didn't know that. Doty was 37 years old, the same age that Madison was at the time of the convention. And in Doty's plan, a radial design of streets moves out from the capital, named after the 39 signers of the Constitution. Now, for me, growing up with the signers, albeit as streets, has proven very useful in studying the Constitution. I know that Patterson, the delegate from New Jersey, who tried to protect equal state suffrage, spelled his name with one T. And I know that Jennifer, a little known delegate from Maryland, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer, spelled his name similarly with only one N. And I keep track of the men who did not sign, George Mason, Elbridge Jerry, Edmund Randolph, Luther Martin, by asking myself, I'm pretty sure they're not a street in Madison. But there's a larger problem. The names that are important in Madison, Wisconsin, bear an odd relation to the convention. Take Mifflin Street, where the Mifflin Street block party in Madison, Wisconsin was held famously during the v Vietnam War in 1969. Madison, Mifflin was a Pennsylvania delegate who never appears in Madison's notes. And Langdon Street and its neighbor Gilman Street 
loom large among the University of Wisconsin students as the social area for the campus, but they're named for Thomas Langdon and Nicholas Gilman of New Hampshire, who arrived months late having to pay their own way. And one of the most important streets in Madison, Pinckney Street, is actually named after one of the two Pinckneys, whose central purpose by the end of the convention was to ensure that Southern slave interests were protected. And so my sense of the names bears relatively little resemblance to the standard story of the convention, and maybe in some way this disjunction helped me think about the framers and the convention in new ways. One important purpose of history is to remind us that those in the past could not see the future. The late historian Bernard Balin wrote that what impresses the historian are the latent limitations within which everyone involved was obliged to act. The inescapable boundaries of action, the blindness of the actors, the grand struggle of history is to try and see the past in a way that remembers that we know the outcome, but they did not. And this project is particularly difficult when we deal with the history of the Constitutional Convention, one of the great founding narratives of our nation. Now, most of the story we tell comes from Madison's notes of the Constitutional Convention. They're actually named a top treasure by the Library of Congress, and they're located appropriately in the Madison building with a statue of James Madison, and um, the Madison, the Library of Congress holds a birthday party for James Madison. I got to speak there at the 265th. And my book, when it came out, was surprisingly controversial to me for its claim that Madison was not necessarily taking notes for us, for posterity. Because Madison, like the other members of the Philadelphia Convention, did not know they were going to write the Constitution. Now, we shouldn't be that surprised because Madison did not cooperate at his death with anniversaries. People may know that Jefferson and Adams died on the same day, July 4th, 1826, coincidentally, 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. James Monroe, who was kind of always a good follower, followed suit and appropriately died precisely five years later. George Washington had caught a cold and died in 1799, so he didn't know this was how you were supposed to, how you were supposed to die. In early 1836, Madison, who was 85's health failed. And according to Dolly Madison's grandniece, the physicians actually wanted to prolong his life so he could die on July 4th, 1836, the 60th anniversary of the Declaration. But Madison did not participate in this death for posterity. He refused to take what were referred to as necessary stimulants, probably opium, and he died on June 28th slightly short of the 60th anniversary. And only after his death was his manuscript on the debates of the Constitutional Convention finally published. Now, before I tell you the story of Madison's creation of the notes, let me give you just a brief background about Madison and the convention. In the summer of 1787, a constitution was written. And we might know the general outlines. The Constitution that first governed the country after the American Revolution had only one branch of government. There was a unicameral Congress, and each state was represented by a delegation having one vote. That Constitution, which on its piece of paper was referred to as the Articles of Confederation, had no separate executive, and it had no independent judiciary. It required unanimous consent to amend it. So they had a constitution, just one that wasn't working. And Congress in 1787 asked the states to send delegates to render the federal constitution, that is the government under the Articles of Confederation, adequate to the exigencies of government and the preservation of the Union. In the spring of 1787, 74 delegates were elected to the convention. On May 25th, a seven-state quorum was finally reached, and over that summer, 55 delegates attended. Rhode Island never sent delegates, New Hampshire's arrived late, and New York lost its vote in early July when two of the three delegates left, stranding Alexander Hamilton. On September 17th, the convention adjourned, 41 were present, 39 signed. 
Now, Thomas Jefferson famously said that the Constitutional Convention was an assembly of demigods. But demigods can be hard to identify with. In fact, even in this very famous painting of the convention, um, signing, which is this is in the House of Representatives outside, James Madison was portrayed so that he looked more like our imaginary demigod than he was at the time. They painted him similar to his 1805 Gilbert Stuart portrait, done when he was Secretary of State, as opposed to what he actually looked like, which was this very young 36-year-old you see here uh, down in the lower left-hand corner. And I've on occasion wondered if political science, law, and history professors of this period, particularly the overwhelmingly male professors who write in this area, find in James Madison something of themselves. He was quite short, and you can see here I am at Montpelier with the apparently life-size James Madison. He was not a particularly snazzy professor, dresser and favored black. He was unlucky as a young man in romance, but then married late in life the irrepressible Dolly Madison. He was also the son of a Virginia plantation owner. And during Madison and Madison's lifetime, nearly 100 enslaved people lived at Montpelier. At various times in his life, he was for and against states' rights versus the national government and for and against majority rights and the minority. He wrote many of the Federalist Papers. He's singularly responsible for the first 10 amendments. He was a relatively successful two-term president. And in an 1836 eulogy, John Quincy Adams praised him as the father of the Constitution. But it is his note-taking at the convention for which he has become most famous. He left the only seemingly complete set of notes of the convention. And he then outlived every other member of the convention. This was not surprising. His mother lived to be 97 and died only seven years before James Madison. And as the other framers died, Madison actually kept track of their deaths. And when everyone else was gone, he got the final word. What the historian Drew McCoy nicely termed, he was the last of the fathers. Now, how important are the notes? Over 600 books have been written on the convention and innumerable articles. And almost every book and article at its core relies on the story as told through James Madison's eyes in his notes. The notes provide the basic narrative. Supreme Court decisions also refer to James Madison and his notes, particularly since the 1980s with the rise of the originalist school. This is one of my most favorite quotes by Chief Justice Roberts. Madison was the principal drafter of the Constitution, and he knew what he was talking about. I happen to disagree with both of those statements by the Chief Justice with all due respect. And the framers are part of popular culture. I have a significant collection of New Yorker cartoons, um, all using the iconography of a group of men, usually wearing wigs, gathered around a table, signing something. This sort of symbolizes both the Declaration uh, and, um, and the Constitution. So a number of years ago, I decided to write a biography of the notes. The manuscript's 136 and a half sheets of paper. They are nine by 15 inches. James Madison folded them in four in half, creating four pages to write on. And with some little slips of paper, the notes amount to over 500 pages. And you can see uh, this is the first page of the notes um, on the slide. They're not the only record of the convention. There's an official record of the convention compiled by its secretary, William Jackson, and it included a journal and a series of vote tallies. And here's the vote tally that states that the Constitution was unanimously agreed to, according to Jackson, apparently twice. And there are other notes that survive from 10 other delegates. Madison's, however, are the only notes that cover every day of the convention, beginning in May and ending on September 17, 1787. And more importantly, no other notes depict Madis the convention as Madison's notes do. 
political drama, compelling characters, lengthy discourses on political theories, crushing disappointments, miraculous successes, and the men whom loom large in our story of the convention are the ones who intrigued or frustrated Madison. To write about the notes is to write about Madison's view of the convention. Now, I wanted to study the notes as an artifact, not just a text. And an artifact is a physical history is a physical object with a particular history of composition. And that history of composition tells us something about the person and the moment in which it was created. And so the most important thing about the notes is that they are covered with revisions. That fact has actually been known. When the notes were published in 1840, they were described by Dolly Madison as revised. And Madison left a note on the last page of the manuscript explaining that he had not made all the revisions. But people had previously avoided exploring the significance of the revisions, and their magnitude had been completely underestimated. So one of the great things about this project was I got to see the manuscript in person in the conservation ad at the Library of Congress. Nowadays, um, the library, since I've done this project, has gotten great images of um, the manuscript. And you can see that uh, through the Consource Quill project, the new LOC uh, images, or you can see them through the library. To study the revisions, we put Manus Madison's notes on a light table at the conservation division and looked at the watermarks. And actually, the new images are good enough that you can see a lot of the watermarks. And using the low technology of colored pencils, I created a version of what the notes looked like in 1787. And you can see my little markup down there in the bottom right. Now, the revisions enhance the manuscript's significance. The story of Madison's composition of the notes emphasizes his inability and that of his fellow delegates to perceive the extraordinary document that the Constitution would become in our lives. Tracing Madison's composition of the notes guides us back to a moment when the substance and fate of the Constitution were uncertain. What was it like to be at the convention and not know you were writing the Constitution. Recreating Madison's original text helps us see this moment when the Constitution still meant a system of government, and the idea and power of the Constitution as a genre of written document was just beginning to be invented and manipulated. Now, in investigating Madison's notes, three key points emerge. First of all, although modern historians and political scientists often refer to them as the notes, they tend to rely on them as if they were taken by a court reporter or stenographer. But the original notes were actually an example of a genre known as a legislative diary. In the 18th century, legislative proceedings were closed, much like Supreme Court deliberations are today and the public only had the right to the final product, legislation, and a formal journal of procedural motions. Newspapers published debates, but they were largely fictionalized. In fact, although the House of Representatives would open its doors in 1789 to the public, the Senate remained closed until 1795. And without published accounts of debates, Legislators relied on private diaries to describe and record political commitments and strategic blunders. blunders. Madison kept a legislative diary in Congress before he went to the convention, and he shared that diary with Thomas Jefferson. It was also revised, and here you can see he originally said he was going to Philadelphia, and then later he said, I left to go to the convention. Now, a second insight relates to the notes reliability. They were used, they've been used as if they reflected a contemporaneous complete account, but they're actually what historians call a fair copy. They were written up by Madison from rough notes he took probably twice a week. He was limited by technologies, and I mean the quill pen and steel eraser. He did not know shorthand, and he used rough abbreviations which would have become increasingly difficult to sort out later on. His speed was limited. We believe he wrote down less than 10% of what was said. And twice a week on Wednesday and Sunday, Madison probably wrote up his rough notes into what we now have as the notes when he did his correspondence. And this biweekly habit affected the composition. The longest speeches in the notes appear on Saturday, not because they were the most important, but because on Sunday the convention did not meet and Madison had the opportunity to 
create, recreate Saturday's proceedings from his rough notes with a pretty close notion of what had happened. But when he wrote about events on Monday and Thursday, he knew what the convention had gone on to decide. So those days were always written from, with hindsight. And from the first days of the notes, Madison was revising his understanding. Now, students know that when they're called on, it's very hard to record what you actually said during class. And this is true of Madison's speeches also. Although Madison's speeches are often cited by historians and political scientists, they're actually the most troubling in terms of reliability. Madison didn't speak from notes. In fact, the book suggests that in the years immediately following the convention, Madison replaced several of the sheets containing his speeches in order to distance himself from statements that became controversial. And this process of rewriting his rough notes resulted in one of the strongest stylistic aspects of the notes. Madison imposed a consistent detached style on speakers. He used a third person narrative voice, Mr. So-and-so insisted, and significantly he summarized the point of every speech at the outset. He created a first summary sentence, and so consistent is this topic sentence style that the notes can be read completely by reading the first sentence of every speech. The notes were never an objective record, and they always chronicled discussions filtered through Madison's brains with a time delay. Now, a third point relates to the audience. People read the notes as if they were intended for us, for posterity, and Madison probably had some idea of that. But they were largely at the time written so that he could track the political ideas and positions of allies and opponents. And importantly, they were written for Thomas Jefferson, who was in Paris. Indeed, that summer, Madison promised that he would share the notes with him, just as he had shared his congressional notes. And in this regard, the notes really belong to accounts that emphasize Madison and Jefferson as collaborators. Now, the notes also help us see new things about Madison. Madison is no Federalist in the original notes. The original notes for June and July are fixated on Madison's obsessive desire to create a powerful national government with proportional representation in both houses. More than anything, he wanted the states to lose their representation vote in Congress. And the notes reveal that Madison opposed completely the Federalist compromise that our modern Congress embodies, in which the House represents population and the Senate the states. Virginia would have benefited enormously from Madison's plan. It held nearly 300,000 people enslaved. It held nearly half the enslaved population of the United States. And the notes show that the small state's anxiety was repeatedly about Virginia's possible political power, a concern about a national government dominated by one state, by a slave-owning state, rather than a philosophy against state sovereignty. The original notes show how Madison encouraged the development of a Southern voting bloc. Madison thought that by persuading the three Southern states, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, to join with the three largest states, Virginia, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, he could get proportional representation in both houses. In late June and July, Madison repeatedly hinted at a sectional division between Northern and Southern states over slavery. And he even proposed that Congress reflect this division with one branch representing free white inhabitants and the other representing all people, free and enslaved African Americans. But enslaved African Americans would not vote. And so Madison's plan was designed to give voting power to states that legalized slavery. That idea was never formally adopted. But Madison's insistence that there was a sectional division over slavery and his suggestion that the slave states needed to protect their interests in the national government instigated the dynamic that led to five constitutional provisions protecting slavery and to the three-fifths clause that would give the slave states disproportionate power in the early republic. After leaving the convention, Madison would blame North Carolina and Georgia, South Carolina and Georgia for this compromise over slavery. And his notes when published would be eventually cited as proof of an unavoidable compromise. But Madison was himself in some ways the catalyst. 
His willingness to embrace slavery in the Constitution reflected his personal compromise over slavery. He believed slavery to be against the principles of the revolution, but he could not imagine the reality of a multiracial American nation. Madison freed no one at his death. Indeed, his will left the profits from the sale of the notes to the American Colonization Society, a group dedicated to sending free African Americans to Africa. Now, the original notes also show us Madison's talent for drafting. By the dr first draft on, let me switch the slide here. Whoops, Ooh, sorry there. By the first draft on August 6th, Madison had lost most of his key ideas and the states had gained lots of control in the federal government. Madison was upset, and in fact, he was not put on the first draft committee. But he carefully copied that draft into his notes, and by doing so became familiar with the structure, language, and substance. And he took on a new role at the convention. He turned out to have a particular talent for working out semantic compromises that sidestepped theoretical disputes. And he repeatedly argued successfully to give Congress broad congressional powers. Now, the notes as an artifact show us that Madison never finished the notes. In late August, as the delegates sent controversial issues to committees dealing with slavery, postponed matters, and the final draft, Madison was chosen for those committees. He also became sick, something that he was prone to under stress, and he stopped copying and writing up his rough notes. He never finished them. The notes that we have today after August 21st do not date from the summer of 1787. Madison was actually too involved in drafting the document to bother writing up his rough notes, and it was probably impossible for him to disentangle debates in committees from debates on the convention floor. And thus, at the very moment when the convention decided most of the issues we care about today, congressional powers, impeachments, the vice president, the electoral college, treaty power, the grouping and relationships that converted 23 articles of the first draft into the seven of our Constitution, the notes are not contemporaneous. When Madison returned to complete and revise the notes, his understanding of the Constitution had changed. Madison had gone on to join Hamilton to write the Federalist Essays, and in his best essay, Federalist 37, Madison insisted that the Constitution was not written by an ingenious theorist in his closet or his imagination. He cautioned those who looked for artificial structure and regular symmetry. But Madison tried to persuade opponents to join in ratifying the Constitution, and he increasingly began to construct rationales and write as if there had been a single intent. In June of 1788, Madison attended the Virginia Ratifying Convention, and he explained the Constitution in ways to appeal to Virginia slaveholders and pro-Virginia advocates. And he began to deny that there had been efforts to consolidate the government and diminish the states. And then, as a member of the first Congress, Madison repeatedly confronted the difficulties of interpreting the document. With delight in 1789, he noted, the Constitution does not perfectly correspond with the ideas I entertained of it at first glance. Finally, in June of 1789, Madison proposed amendments to the Constitution. Madison wanted them incorporated into the text. He wanted the amendments to be interwoven. In essence, he wanted the Constitution revised in line by line. Roger Sherman insisted that the amendments be in supplemental, tacked on the end. He argued that the Constitution was sacred and lodged in the archives of Congress, and it shouldn't be basically revised. After a long fight in Congress, the Sherman side won. The Congress decided the amendments would be tacked on the end. The original 12 amendments were sent out to the states for ratification. Only with this division decision was the text of the 1787 convention clearly to be forever visibly intact. And now Madison's notes suddenly retained additional relevance.
1789, Jefferson returned to the United States and Madison rushed to complete his notes. He secretly acquired the official journal of the convention from George Washington. George Washington's diaries for those dates is missing, and we don't know why or how Washington came to give the, the journal to Madison. Madison began copying that journal on August 20th, the part where his original notes had stopped, and having finished that, he went back and copied the entire journal. He used that journal to try and complete his notes. Far more than the original notes, the post-August 21st notes focus on textual alterations in the drafting process and reasons for it. Madison went back and reinserted all the technical language from the journal. So, for example, here you can see where originally, in the red section, he'd written down when Charles Pinckney suggested they put rights in the Constitution. And he later replaced it with the lengthy technical language that Pinckney had used. And as Madison revised the notes to convert his diary into a record of debates, he converted himself into a different Madison. In the original notes, he's often grumpy, irritated, or annoyed. But slowly, by altering a word here, a phrase there, he became a moderate, dispassionate observer and thoughtful, intellectual founder of the Constitution. And then in the 1790s, Madison made further revisions to suggest convention support for Jefferson's politics. Jefferson returned seeing the world through the lens of the French Revolution, supporters of Republican government versus monarchists. And Madison shared the notes with Jefferson. Jefferson had a young relative studying with him, John Epps, copy the manuscript. And the notes created or encouraged Jefferson's obsession that Alexander Hamilton was a secret monarchist. During this period, Madison also replaced some of his own speeches, particularly ones in which he had been heard to make statements now opposed to Jefferson's vision. Madison would later say that his actions in this period were too often tinged with the party spirit of the times. By 1796, the final sheets were likely in place. And in December 1796, Madison retired briefly from politics. Jefferson became vice president to John Adams, a member of the opposing party. Jefferson urged publication. A most anxious desire is expressed that you would publish your debates of the Constitution. He believed that Madison's notes would support his interpretation of the Constitution, one that would undermine the Adams administration. But Madison demurred. He worried that Jefferson had not read all the notes, and he worried that the notes would not support Jefferson's interpretation. The whole volume ought to be examined with an eye to the use of which every part is susceptible. And moreover, he thought that the other living members of the convention would have different recollections. Other reports would perhaps be made out and mustered, and those reports might not confirm Madison's version. It was a problem what turn might be given to the impression on the public mind. Nothing in the notes would damage Jefferson's reputation. He wasn't there. But for Madison, the expediency of publication weighed differently. The notes were not published. Jefferson moved on to a different interpretation of the Constitution, one in which argued that the Constitution was a compact among the states. And perhaps with relief, Madison put the notes away. Only in retiring from the presidency in 1817 did Madison once again go back to revise his notes, and now he revises them to increase the appearance that they were comprehensive. He added revisions from the official journal of the convention now published by the government. He inserted missing sections of speeches paraphrased from New York delegate Yates's notes, notes that he publicly criticized. And he and his brother-in-law prepared a transcript which planned to publish the notes as part of a larger context with Madison's letters inserted. But although he repeatedly flirted with publication, he refrained. Not until 1827-1828 did the three other most significant note-takers at the convention, Rufus King, John Lansing, and William Jackson, die. Only in 1829 did Madison know that when he published his notes, no other notes would appear. But at that point, he settled on posthumous publication. Madison's will left the notes to Dolly Madison. 
After publishers failed to give her a significant amount, Congress agreed to buy the papers for $30,000. And in 1840, Madison's notes were finally published in a three volume collection of his papers. Now, countless historians repeated a statement in the introduction which reassured readers of the contemporaneous accuracy of the notes, but Madison never actually wrote in his own hand that the notes were written that summer. Dolly Madison added that section in her handwriting. Madison had never settled on a precise explanation about their relationship to the Constitution. Over the years that Madison worked on his manuscript, his smallest revisions subtly altered the meaning of the Constitution. The most important is actually on the first page in the first sentence. In the original notes, the first sentence reads, Monday, May 14th was the day fixed for the meeting of the deputies in convention for revising the federal Constitution. But many years later, Madison revised this sentence. He crossed out Constitution and replaced it with system of government. The notes now insisted that the very purpose of the convention had been to transform a country with a federal system of government into one under a Constitution, a piece of paper drafted in 1787. The erasure of the original words hid the fact that in 1787, the Constitution written at Stummer still referred to a system of government. The genre was invented after 1787, not that summer. The new meaning of Constitution had arisen over the years from the ongoing process of drafting, ratifying, disputing, interpreting, and living under the Constitution. And Madison's notes show us that only much later did Madison realize that. Madison understood his revisions as repeated efforts to create a record, his record, of what he saw as significant about the convention. Yet every revision increased the distance from the summer of 1787. Over the years, words, concepts, compromises shifted focus and took on new meanings. Motivations were disputed. And the convention could not see the Constitution until the final days, and from the moment it became visible, it was contested. Over the first decade in the years after 1787, the Constitution survived and slowly began to be the Constitution. But only with hindsight did the meaning of the convention and the Constitution begin to be shaped. My next book, Female Genius, this is the cover here, builds on this larger understanding of the Constitution to argue that the original written document was open to female participation and to the radical transatlantic concept of female genius. Madison's narrative in the notes was always that of James Madison, a member. Beginning in 1787 and continuing for a half a century afterwards, he struggled to understand what had happened that summer. That's a struggle that continues into our own day. Thank you very much. Professor Builder, thank you so much. That was spellbinding. That was just great. Um, uh, if attendees want to ask questions, uh, please feel free to, you know, raise your blue hand in Zoom as we're sort of all uh, accustomed to do today. Um, yeah, if you want to ask questions, just go ahead and raise your hand. Gary, would it be better if I stopped sharing or you want me to keep the share? Um, you can stop sharing. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, while I give people a minute to, to sort of formulate their questions or, or raise their hand, um, so just so that I got this straight, um, Mad Madison was the catalyst for some of the main slavery defending um, components of the Constitution, uh, but he used his notes to subtly shift the blame to South Carolina and Georgia and kind of minimize his role there. Uh, yeah, and he, you know, he, a thing that people don't um, always know about Madison is he was the drafter of the, um, what was at that time called the federal ratio, which was the three fifths mm -hmm. rule in, uh, under the Articles of Confederation. So he had, um, for, you know, the three fifths clause actually goes back to Madison in a lot of, um, uh, in a lot of respects. And one of the, things that was very interesting to me when I worked on this was that Madison um, revises, you know, the fact that he's a nationalist in some way. He revises uh, other aspects of um, his presentation. He does not revise his um, support for slavery. 
And that tells us something about where he is in the, um, uh, in the 1790s. Um, he's one of the people who works very hard when he's in Congress to make sure that the Quaker slave petitions, uh, the anti-slavery petitions don't go through. So he has a very complicated, um, a very complicated relationship with slavery, which um, in my opinion, for a long time, historians uh, and political scientists were really sort of too willing to push to one side. That's really interesting. Um, okay, so yeah, so it's interesting that you you sort of bring that that, that aspect of, of slavery up because as you, as you know, um, some of his revisions like suggests that over time he's sort of rewriting it to be more Jeffersonian um, in its orientation. And I just wonder how much this, this question of slavery and that, that tilt towards Jefferson kind of fit together. Yeah, so the part that he ran into problems with, with, um, with certainly Jefferson in that period is, um, it's because of your aptly named Alexander Hamilton um, forum, you know, um, uh, Jefferson, and Adams, both abroad during the convention, um, come back uh, um, and and eventually come to sort of um, to sort of create two very different notions of how you can understand the United the United States. And um, Jefferson's convinced that what happened at the convention was that there were secret monarchists, um, people who were creating a national government that would basically eventually be designed to evolve into a monarchist British government. And what he meant by monarchy um, was not necessarily in the first instance a hereditary monarch, but he thought that they thought that there was a thing called an elective monarch, which would have been like a president on lifetime tenure. And we know people at the convention um, voted for a president and lifetime tenure. For Madison, one of the problems is the Virginia delegation actually votes in favor of a president on lifetime tenure. So that would have been a president who would be just like the Supreme Court justices today. Uh, once they were elected, they could only be impeached. And um, uh, there were contemporaneous models for that. But but we, by the time Jefferson comes back, um, Jefferson very much fuses the hereditary royal notion of monarchy with this notion of monarchy as a single rule to which you could have been elected and impeached. And um, those are the sections that Madison is most worried about. Um, he's not as worried about um, uh, Jefferson and slavery, and Jefferson's very complicated um, on slavery. Um, certainly his notes on the state of Virginia both say slavery is terrible, but they also create the beginnings of what becomes um, the argument from biological racism to support slavery. I don't want to monopolize any of the time. Does anybody have a question? I can promote you to a panelist. You can, you can ask your question to Professor Builder if you like. Yeah, it's horrible to have to type your question out, right, in my right. opinion. Yeah, that's yeah, my, well, <laughs> that's, yeah, no, that's we'll my only, that's my on. only, I think. I'll tell, while people are thinking about whether they actually want to do it, I'll tell a funny story about, um, uh, so I was really fortunate in doing this project in getting access to see Madison's notes. At the time, the only um, images of Madison's notes, which, um, which are partly why people, no one, I mean, my book's, my book could have been written a long time ago if there had been digital photography, um, but um, but there were very bad images of the notes. Um, they were worse than anybody's anything today would um, uh, would take. And so the library was very nice, and they gave me some access to the notes. Um, very highly supervised. And one time when I was that, I always kept my hands behind my back because I didn't want to do anything anything problematic and I had this terribly runny nose and I had this horrible feeling like you know what if what if my nose my nose dripped on Madison's on Madison's notes and another time I was down there we were looking at some letters to check watermarks and I'd been given a new ID by the library and I'd had my hand in the pocket with the idea and I slit my finger open 
And when I pulled my finger out, it was like covered with blood. So I promptly stuck my right hand, which is back in my pocket, and proceeded to pretend that I was a lefty um, because I figured if I dripped blood on um, Madison's papers, I wasn't going to get any access back again uh, at the library. But they're wonderful people at the Library of Congress. And one of the really great things uh, coming out of um, my book and, uh, and some efforts by um, others to really think about what images are helpful is that um, we now have brand new um, really great high resolution images of all of these documents and the library has been working really really hard on creating um, accessibility both through those documents and through the founders archive so that people themselves can you know not have to rely on what someone like me says you can go out and you can um, and you can look yourself that's cool um, yeah so are all, are, do you know if all these are digitized? Uh, they're all they're all digitized. They're all on. Um, uh, um, you know, the images are all digitized. You can go to the Library um, of um, uh, of Congress and. Um, uh, see them. I, li I like there's a, a question here, not really a question, but a, a great point here um, about the materiality um, of the paper. I, I learned an awful lot about um, watermarks and things like that um, along the way. And, um, and that's a really important aspect when we look at all of the papers from this period is we think about to what degree um, people were able to self curate. And so that's a thing that um, art historians, other people think a lot about, about we think now about archives. And one of the things that's really interesting about certainly James Madison living so long is he was very much able to curate his notes and curate what's left. So for example, we know that um, there are some letters that he sent that summer uh, to people who he was pretty close to. Um, who'd been members of the Virginia delegation, and um, those letters don't exist any longer. Um, and so to the degree that um, Madison told people things, he was, he was able to um, get rid of that kind of letters. And so his letters really represent very much what, um, what he and then what Dolly Madison wanted. And his illness is super interesting. Um, he, he, he suffered a lot from um, from illnesses. Historians debate what his um, illness was, but um, but he um, struggled with stress. And and um, in August he was just incredibly incredibly busy, and he got sick. And he could do enough to sort of keep up with showing up, but not enough to sort of be the superhuman every um, every Saturday night and Sunday. I'm gonna like rewrite my rough notes, and it's a really great example of um, of of how as people and historic figures, there's a a way in which we sometimes forget that. Uh, how was I able to access such precious documents? Uh, a student researcher is able to do the same. Um, no, there is no way the library will ever let you into the um, conservation division. In fact, even when I went there the first time, um, they were very worried about it. And I think they let me in the first time, although I had permission and everything, because C-SPAN was trying to video um, secrets of the Library of Congress at the same time, and they were super distracted. And so the conservators, um, uh, people didn't fuss as much. Um, I don't think you need as much access now, and the library um, is very, very careful about these things. And that's partly why they've worked so hard to digitize in very, very high resolution um, using modern um, conservation techniques, these kinds of materials. And that's true of um, almost all the founding papers now. Um, you can see not just a transcription, but you can, um, you, the library's worked really hard to um, put the microfilm digitized up for people. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think Dan Fram has a question. Dan, yeah. You turn, your, turn your video on. There, there you are, Dan. Hi. Um, I'm looking at my screens awkwardly so i'm gonna be looking like off in the yeah that's okay corner. um so i this is totally absolutely fascinating it looks like extremely meticulous work and thank you so much for sharing it with us uh i was just gonna ask in case um i'm i'm i missed it without everything going by but i wondered if you could just say a little more about um just anything that might change about our interpretation of what the constitution should really mean to us um, just throwing something, I mean, I'm sure we should read your book for a lot of the juiciest details, but I would love to know if there's something you can tell us about, yeah, how we might 
how Madison might have taught, you know, how reading it, the reading your book, reading it the right way, or understanding how Madison revised it should really change the way we think about uh, the Constitution. So I think probably the biggest thing that my book probably stands for among um, historians and other people, and then I've gone on to write this more explicitly, um, is that the what we really see through seeing the original notes is that the Constitution in that summer when they were writing it wasn't yet a known genre of a written constitution the way we come to understand it, right? We think, looking back, we're, we're, oh, what they said was this because they meant this because they somehow miraculously knew that there was gonna be a Supreme Court that they hadn't even invented that was gonna interpret it, writing written opinions, which they hadn't invented. And, and the book really shows that um, the big takeaway is that the constitution isn't yet understood that way. Right, it's not understood that way. It is, an, I, the language I now use is, it's an instrument. They're trying to describe a system of government using words. But the notion that those words are the Constitution themselves and only the Constitution is not present that summer. And that's an incredibly important point because a lot of obviously modern constitutional um, interpretive theories depend on this um, I think it's sort of a postmodern move that you imagine that in the summer of 1787, 1789, everybody knew there was a thing called a written constitution in which people would read it just by the words on the page and the Supreme Court would interpret it. So that's one super important um, takeaway. I think another super important takeaway is that the things that they cared a lot about that summer that they really fought over are things that um, uh, are structural aspects that we take for granted. So the vast majority of the things they cared about and fought over involved what we now think of as the Federalist Compromise, right? Most of the what people wanted was to, on Madison's side, was to get rid of the states having an equal vote in Congress. And Madison lost that. I mean, he, he goes down in flames. And um, and Madison actually also wanted something called the negative. So he wanted Congress to be able to veto all state legislation. He loses that also. Um, even in the fall, he's writing Thomas Jefferson. That's like a huge loss. I have no idea how the government's going to work. And, and so, so the things they cared about are really not things we care about. And the things we care about disproportionately come at the last minute from the part of the notes and the drafting that happens very fast in the end. It comes out of committees. It often comes out of the postponed committee. There's very little debate about it. And yet we tend to come to that thinking that everybody thought really hard about that. And the book really puts us back in the space of thinking like, no, they, this, this, this was stuff they weren't worried about. What they were really worried about was, um, were they gonna have three branches? Were they going to have um, a Congress that was bicameral with proportional representation or not? What power were the slave states going to have from the fact that they enslaved people? Those were the kinds of big, um, of, of really big questions um, that mattered. And, and so by getting back into that space, um, uh, we can see it. And you can you can really see, it's super interesting, if you look at the notes after August 21st, um, even by 1789, when Madison goes back, mostly because of the debates over amending the con Constitution, um, he had begun to have a sense like, people might be interested how we got those words there. And so that section of the notes is way more focused on him saying, here's the drafting changes. But, um, but that's all added later on, right? That's, so, that, so what we see is that the Constitution, that whole notion of the Constitution is beginning very slowly to be understood. But, um, but you know, the Supreme Court doesn't even exist yet. No one's figured out, it, you have to have one Supreme Court, but nobody even knows what that means. So, um, so I really think that's just an incredibly big takeaway. Um, you know, my opinion is if you want to make up a interpretive scenario where you pretend that, that's fine. But, um, but you can't really see that in the documents at the time. Great, thanks. Yeah, I guess that connects right back to the beginning of your talk about the, the, um, the historian's journey of really trying to 
get us to reimagine what it's like not to know how things turn out. And, exactly. Um, yeah, that's that is super interesting. I see that there are some chats, uh, some other questions, so I'll just make way. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the great question. Um, yeah. So we've got an, another question from uh, Taylor Phillips. Uh, you make a compelling case that Madison extensively revised his notes, the benefits of years of hindsight, seeing how the American experiment played out. Do any of these changes still impact any like current political debate, especially with originalists lying on what I now understand to be at the very least slightly biased account of the founders intentions and in debate? Yeah, so, you know, I think one of the things um, uh, so, so there's a way we say originalism in a kind of um, gestalty, informal, I sometimes call it like the ordinary person sense. And that's not what people who actually write about originalism argue now. Originalism has um, uh, uh, transformed itself in a number of multiple, and there's now multiple schools of originalism. Um, so some of those people, um, um, there's a there's a group of people who are originalists who um, are very focused on the convention and they really care about the convention and they're really interested in the convention and I think um, for them it's become very important to think about whether you're citing to the to the earlier part of the notes where we're pretty confident that but for some speeches that's that's okay, or whether you're citing from the later notes. And so an example of this kind of thing would be um, Michael McConnell's new book, where um, uh, Mike's pretty careful about, you know, where he's taking information from. Um, I, I think for other people, what um, probably has happened is people pull back from the notes. They're like, well, whatever, we don't have to care about what happened that summer. Uh, we're going to care about the words themselves, how some dictionary saw words, or um, we're going to care about um, things we can pull out of the ratification debates. And so either original, what sometimes is called original public meaning, or sometimes now called semantic originalism. And, um, and that's sort of popular among academics. Um, I don't really, it's not so popular on the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court tries not to cite Madison's notes too often. They're, they're worried about it as a text. Um, but, but the narrative that comes out of the notes is still pretty important. Um, so, I, so I think his, his um, you know, that story there is still important. I, I think for me, what's been really exciting about the project and the response to the books is that um, it reminds us how important this period is and how much new stuff there is to write about, right? Sometimes we think about this period as, um, as very static and honestly kind of boring. I mean, I certainly thought that a little bit. I still think that there's things like the removal debate that my eyes glaze over. And I think that more we can explain the, that there were um, multiple positions and a big argument and people really cared and they had different they had different understandings and theories of what would happen and a lot of times nobody won just people came up with a thing that allowed it to get past I, I happen to think that makes the period much more interesting um, I happen to think this period is a super interesting period because um, in my new book, I call the 1780s the age of the Constitution, that the, the idea that more people ought to be represented in government was a transatlantic idea. And our Constitution represents some aspects of that story and also represents some aspects of people in power's attempt to use those constitutions to exclude people. And thinking of this moment as a dynamic moment where there are people arguing in all sides to me is very exciting. Um, I think there are other people who don't like it. They want it to be a very stable moment. And it's sort of like, you know, Aristotle and Plato and the great said this and now we descend. But that's not what I find exciting about the moment. Um, yeah, that, that's really great. I, I was, it's funny that you bring up Aristotle and Plato and this is what the great said. Um, because that's, that's, I guess that's also what I think is so interesting about this work is because it takes, like you said, something that's very static and kind of boring and it makes it human. And like you said, dynamic. Um, it also, what, what I kind of like about it is that it undercuts this sort of um, attempting to imply the constitutional law is apolitical. Like it's, 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 you know, inescapably political. It was politics then. 
Um, so yeah, I just I, and I, and they and they know that and that that's so I call myself a constitutionalist, not a living constitutionalist because that would be redundant. Um, and and I think one of the really remarkable things about this moment is that people are really trying to figure out. Um, how do you take the notion of constitution, which had an organic notion, which was understood as a system of government and the traditions and laws and all of this, and, and, and how do you begin to think about writing down aspects of that as a frame? And then how do you not end up with the problems of words? And so if you think about it that way, it's, a, it's just a super, super interesting problem. It's a problem that's about how do we understand our history? How do we understand language? How do we understand political theory? And then very importantly, how do we understand um, representation? Because at the end of the day, what, what this period is very much about is a shift towards a notion that what legitimates government is representation by the people, right? And we know that because our constitutional preamble begins, we the people, in big, big letters. And so what does we the people mean? And how does this system of government fulfill that? And that's, uh, that's something that, you know, people in all over um, the Atlantic world are worrying about in this moment. And to, so the more we can begin to put our constitution back in that space, as part of an exciting constitution, um, uh, that would be great. A wonderful new book by Linda Colley um, uh, uh, tries to do that by thinking about constitution as a concept that's beginning to move around the world. And she taught, she looks at constitutional developments uh, and constitution writing um, in Haiti and Russia. And we can begin to see how are people using this tool. And, and a constitution, the written constitution, I believe, um, is a genre and people begin to learn how to manipulate it. And so um, one of the things that I write about in my new book is how people begin to understand that if you, if you embed things in this written document, they are stickier and harder to shift than if you if they're just customary or if they're just in legislation. And that begins the pattern of exclusion. So it um, uh, really begins um, a little bit in the 1790s, but then very much in the 1800s, where particularly at the state level, um, state constitution writers begin to understand that if you can get into your state constitution, voting exclusion. So we see the rise of um, white male as the description for who can participate. You can actually preserve your embedded power. And um, early constitutions, right, the New Jersey Constitution allows women to vote uh, and African Americans to vote. So we see constitution developing as a genre, but also as a sort of tool that allows you to control power. And that to me is a way more interesting thing to think about than you know that yeah. so this was fascinating um do we have any more questions um if we don't uh, i think we may may wrap up okay it looks like we're out of questions um this was super great thank you so much professor builder uh, thanks so much i really appreciate it yeah uh, all right everyone that'll that'll conclude this event um, and uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks on October 14th. Um, we have um, our next event on should the United States increase immigration. Um, so that'll be a, a talk um, with two people, um, Alex Nauraste, um and Peter Scary on immigration policy. Um, and so we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, have a great evening. Thanks so much.